We're now going to begin our study of AC power in AC circuits. To date, much of our effort has been focused on calculating how the voltage and the current change in DC and AC circuits. And we've already studied how power is transferred or stored in elements of DC circuits. So what we want to do is we want to take that type of analysis and apply it to AC circuits. And the reason that we are so concerned about AC circuits is that um, the transmission of power in AC circuits is the most important quantity for uh, telling us how efficient communication systems are and power delivery systems are. In the United States, we deliver our power um, from the power plants across the domestic grid at a frequency of 60 hertz, and this is uh, delivered as a sine wave. Other countries use different frequencies for the delivery of their power, most commonly 50 hertz. And what AC power delivery allows us to do, as opposed to DC power delivery, is deliver this power at a high voltage and transmit this energy over a very long distance. Um, this makes it easier and more efficient to transfer that power than DC power delivery would. The other reason that we want to talk about this is because um, devices that use power uh, are commonly comprised of coils of wire, which are inductors, and magnets. Um, this shows up most commonly in um, motors and power generation elements. So in motors, we're um, alternating the current that passes through coils of wire, and we know from physics that that uh, change in current passing through a wire induces a magnetic field. That magnetic field then interacts with the magnets that are uh, in the motor and cause that motor to turn. Of course, to generate power, we do the opposite. Uh, we use some type of energy, usually the expansion of a gas, uh, a hot, uh, high energy gas such as steam, through a turbine, and that turbine in turn turns the shaft of a generator. Well, the shaft of the generator is comprised of either magnets or coils of wire that rotate in a magnetic field. Uh, and that rotation in the, mag in the magnetic field, or that change in the magnetic field, causes a current to be produced in the coils of wire, or the inductive elements um, of the generator. So understanding how um, power is generated, or how electrical energy is generated through interac the interaction of mechanical energy into electrical energy is important, and how that energy is transferred to different elements within a circuit or within a system is important to understand. However, before we talk about um, calculating the power that's delivered to elements or stored in elements within an electronic system, we need to understand how we can characterize the nature of the sinusoids that are occurring within the system. So, to date, what we have looked at is we have envisioned our sinusoidal voltage or current as, and imagine that, characterize that as being a sinusoidal function with an amplitude of A, where the amplitude represents the peak above zero, the, the height above zero, uh, the maximum height above zero at which that uh, periodic uh, wave reaches. We characterize the period as being one complete cycle from where it starts at the, same, uh, at the same value and ends at the same value. So our period is one complete period and that's equal to the inverse of the frequency or in radians it's 2 pi over the angular frequency. Now um, we could characterize or we can characterize the uh, magnitude of this uh, sine wave by its amplitude. But uh, this is not common. This is not the common way to do it. Um, what we want to do is we want to look at the average value of the, uh, the sine wave. Um, so most meters, uh, most multimeters, are going to measure not the absolute amplitude of the sine wave, but when we measure the AC voltage or the AC current using a digital multimeter, it's going to tell us something about the root mean squared value, or the RMS value. So RMS is an acronym or a uh, abbreviation that stands for the root 
mean square value. And this root mean square value is going to give us the average value of the sine wave. And how we calculate the root mean square, it's independent of whether or not it's a sine wave. The only thing that the root mean square tells us about is the average value um, as if it were uh, for a periodic function. So root mean square not only applies to sine waves, it also applies to square waves and triangle waves and sawtooth waves and anything that exhibits a periodic behavior to it. For any periodic signal, again it ha can be a sinusoid, a square wave, a triangle wave, a sawtooth wave, any type of periodic signal, uh, we can calculate the root mean square value or the average value according to the following formula. We're going to take the square root of 1 over the period and we're going to multiply that by the function, the periodic function itself, squared. We're going to integrate that periodic function, that squared periodic function, and over uh, one period, and then we're going to take the square root of that entire thing. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this for a sine wave. So we're going to look at what happens or how we calculate the root mean square value for a, a particular periodic function which happens to be the sine wave function which it could be a voltage or could be a current. So I'm going to represent it as X. Our periodic voltage or current we have typically represented as an amplitude A multiplied by a sine wave. We could also do this with cosine and it's a function of the angular frequency times time. Now again remember that the period here is given as 1 over the frequency in Hertz or 2 pi uh, radians uh, per second divided by the angular frequency or 2 pi radians divided by the angular frequency excuse me. Okay so now I'm going to apply my root mean square formula for this to calculate the root mean square value for this periodic wave. So RMS is going to be equal to the square root of the inverse of the period. The inverse of the period here will be the angular frequency divided by 2 pi. I'm going to integrate this from 0 to the period itself. That's 2 pi over the angular frequency. And my function is going to be the amplitude squared because I'm going to square the entire function times the squared sine function with the argument omega t integrated over time. Alright, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to do a little bit of my calculus. I'm going to pull uh, the, amp the squared amplitude value out. So I'll have omega out of the integral. So I'll have omega over 2, uh, omega a squared over 2 pi and then I need to integrate the sine squared function with my limits of integration, 2 pi over omega. I'm going to take the, the square root of that entire value. Okay, now I need to figure out what the integral of sine squared is so that I can evaluate it. Looking at um, integral tables, I can find that the integral of the sine squared function with the argument u du is going to be equal to 1 half u minus 1 fourth times the sine of 2u plus some constant of integration. Of course we're not going to have that constant of integration because we have definite limits on our integral here. The uh, substitution for the u substitution in this case is omega t. So the derivative term is going to be du is equal to omega since we're taking it with respect to time dt. So that means to integrate this function I need to multiply what's the integrand here by omega. But in order to keep this consistent I also need to divide outside of the integral by uh, omega. All right, so what that does is that causes the constants outside of my integration to cancel out and I will be left with XRMS 
is equal to the square root of a squared over 2 pi. I'm going to, um, sorry, I'm going to evaluate my integral now, um, substituting in this as well as my u substitution. When I do that, I will get uh, 1 half u, which is omega t, minus 1 fourth times the sine of 2 omega t. Evaluated at the limits of 0 and 2 pi omega. All right, so now I'm going to evaluate this function at, two, uh, at, at my limits of integration. So when t, so for this function right here, when t is equal to 2 pi over omega, um, the evaluation of my limits of integration give me 1 half uh, omega times 2 pi over omega minus 1 fourth times the sine of 2 times 2 pi over omega oops uh, and I'm missing my angular frequency term right there that was due to that alright so when I evaluate that when I simplify my omegas cancel my twos cancel I get pi minus one-fourth times the sine of four pi. Right. Evaluating the sine of four pi, uh, that is a multiple of two pi, the sine of two pi or the sine of four pi is going to be zero. So I'm left with just pi when I evaluate my limits of integration here. When I evaluate my limits of integration for t equals zero, this term goes to zero and I also have the sine of zero which we know evaluates to zero so this thing evaluates to zero altogether and I'm left with only the evaluation of pi so taking that information now I see that my RMS value is going to be equal to the square root of a squared over 2 pi multiplied by pi and of course my pi's are going to cancel so my RMS value is going to be the square root of a squared over 2 which evaluates to a divided by the square root of 2. So from this we see that when my function my original function had an amplitude a maximum or peak amplitude of a the RMS value for a sinusoid is going to be the amplitude that maximum amplitude divided by the square root of 2 now this is true for sine waves as well as cosine waves so the effective value or root mean squared value for a sinusoid is always going to be that the peak or maximum voltage divided by the square root of 2 is going to be the um, the RMS voltage and the same thing for current the peak current or the maximum amplitude of the current divided by the square root of 2 is going to give us the effective or RMS current in the system so now we have two different ways that we can express the amplitude of a sinusoidal function either using an RMS value or using the absolute or maximum uh, amplitude value and we can convert the, between the two of them if it is indeed a sine wave using this square root of 2 relationship now if the uh, current or voltage that we're looking at is not a sine wave if it's a square wave a triangle wave or any of the other types of periodic functions we would have to perform this analysis to understand how the maximum or the peak value uh, is related to the root mean square value but most of the time lucky for us uh, when we're looking at these power delivery systems these AC power delivery systems uh, most of the time we're going to try to approximate or um, 
or we're going to try to deliver the power using a sinusoid. So this root 2 dependence is going to apply.